I would like to now present to you the reasons why UNESCO was chosen as the home for science. And maybe I would get this first slide up, please. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to give you a brief overview of the 75 years of science in UNESCO and how UNESCO is promoting the basic sciences for the service of humanity. Obviously, I'm not very savvy with this system. So, hmm. oh, there it goes. We'll see here an overview of all the sustainable development goals. And all of these sustainable development goals need access to science, technology, and innovation. You cannot educate a child who is hungry or thirsty. We do need international scientific cooperation, but we also need science to respond to all of these development challenges. So what are the science-related challenges in the world today? We know that there's a failure of climate change mitigation, adaptation, extreme weather events. We have natural disasters, man-made environmental disasters, biodiversity loss, and the water crisis. And this is putting extreme pressure on natural resources. There are many conflicts. People are being displaced. And the small island developing states, Africa, women, and de developing countries bear the heaviest burden. So what can UNESCO offer? Well, since 1940, oops, sorry. Since 1946, you, the organization has 193 member states and the main objective is to contribute to peace and security in a world through education, science, culture, and communication. Since 75 years, UNESCO is promoting international scientific collaboration acts as a catalyst and a motor for intergovernmental international science cooperation, is a neutral broker. And hence, we have legitimacy and convening powers, but we also the laboratory of ideas and the intellectual clearinghouse. And we serve as a standard setter. And I will share with you some of the ideas that, and work that UNESCO has done in this domain. But we also a capacity builder, developing institutional and human capacities across the world. Now, if we look at the future and science to the service of humanity and science to the SDGs, our motto is that the vision of a world at peace could not be a world without science. So how do we take this forward then? Well, you, UNESCO's member states, have developed the only intergovernmental and international scientific programs since 75 years. I cite a couple of them here, the Intergovernmental Hydrological Program, the Man in the Biosphere, the International Center for Theoretical Physics set up by Abdus Salam, the Nobel Laureate. We have the International Basic Science, we've heard from Miriam. We have the World Water Assessment Report, the World Academy of Sciences, which promotes science in the Global South, uh, local indigenous knowledge systems, and numerous other programs, such as the first ever Earth Science Program valorizing our Mother Earth. So these programs are at the service of member states and contributes to building capacity in all of the member states. But UNESCO's science family is enormous. We have a distinct role that no other bilateral, multilateral environmental agency can bring together. And this is our normative function, our transdisciplinary approach, as I mentioned, ictp twas but we have an exceptional network of specialized Category 2 centers, chairs, national commissions, national committees, the Category 1 center, which is ICTP, and we have scientific regional networks who are willing to provide their services to countries in building capacity across the world. So if we look at the UNESCO science, natural, and exact, exact sciences sector, we are harnessing sciences, the basic science, engineering, technology, and innovation, but knowledge for sustainable development. We advance science for management of natural resources, disaster risk reduction, climate change, but we also want to improve knowledge and strengthen capacities for water safe and water secure world. All of the SDGs are really englobed 
within UNESCO's mandate. And I would like to bring this to the president-elect of the General Assembly, that we can showcase this so we do not duplicate the UN system, but rather build on and scale up what UNESCO has built since 75 years. Now, I want to briefly talk to you about the UNESCO Open Science recommendation. And this recommendation is unique in the world. And the recommendation will bring together actors from all over the world in a standard setting instrument. But prior to that, I want to take you down another road, and that is water. Water is at the center of the SDGs and other related agendas. As I mentioned earlier, we cannot educate a child that is thirsty or hungry. So we see that water connects to all the SDGs because here you see all the indicators are connected. And as the president-elect of the General Assembly is looking at how to measure the SDGs, I think we'll have to look at it from a holistic and systems point of view. Now, if we look at water right now in the world, where have we failed? Why has the basic sciences not contributed to a water secure world? We have SDG 6, which is access to safe water and sanitation largely off track. 2.2 billion people across the world still lack access to safely managed drinking water. But water is the connector, and every drop counts. So what can UNESCO do? Well, since already the 1960s, we had an international hydrological program that has evolved. Today, it's an intergovernmental hydrological program, water, a science for water secure world. And this program will be able to contribute to providing science and understanding the hydrological changes. And we would like to continue to work with you for promoting the basic sciences and access to water. Maybe we don't realize that basic science is critical for providing water services. Now, the 20, just very briefly, I'll run you through our program, Science for Water Secure World, has five priority areas, basic scientific research, water education in the fourth industrial re revolution, and building the knowledge gap. What kind of basic science and innovation do we need for water secure world? How to integrate water resources management? And what kind of governance structures do we need for adaptation and resilience? This is the program of UNESCO for the next eight years, and we look forward to working with you on this. Now, one other topic that was raised by the uh, president-elect of the General Assembly is our environmental uh, challenges that we face today. We know that the biosphere upon which humanity depends has been deeply reconfigured by human activity. 75% of land is altered, 69% of the ocean is facing stress. We've seen this in the Lisbon conference recently. And 90% of Earth is already significantly ordered, altered. 80% of wetland is lost. So what can we do? What can UNESCO do? And what has UNESCO done since its inception? Well, we all recognize that nature is under stress. It's a time for transformation. It's a time also that we have to see our relationships with nature. We have to put science to the working. We have to put science in the making so that we contribute to a better environment for now and for future generations. What can UNESCO offer? UNESCO has a multitude of unique ecological and earth science programs and networks built up in, since the late 40s. I'd like to inform all of you, the first soil map of the world was created by UNESCO in the early 1950s. And today, UNESCO counts 1,154 world heritage sites, natural mixed sites. We, have, we cover 6% of total earth. We have seven, it's more than that now, we've just had some new biosphere reserves where people live in harmony with nature, able to scientifically monitor nature and nature services, but also to restore nature and restore the harmony of our ecosystems. These sites are really addressing climate change, biodiversity crisis, and we are promoting scientific monitoring of the environment. Now, another unique program we're celebrating 50 years this year is a program of geosciences and valuing our geological heritage. This is critical through the International Geoscience Program and the Geoparks Program. We advance new initiatives related to geodiversity for sustainable management of our natural resources. And I believe that these programs are critical and contribute 
to the future mandates that we are looking at for basic sciences. Now, Miriam Shadid briefly talked to us about the program of the International Basic Science Program, which was established in 2005 by UNESCO. And I want to sincerely thank her for raising the value for this International Basic Science Program. And we are promoting uh, capacity building in the basic sciences through our programs here in headquarters, but also our programs in Trieste, which is the International Center for Theoretical Physics, but also the World Academy for Sciences. And I, our colleagues who are here are going to present to you the programs in that regard. But I'd like to inform you that science, technology, engineering, mathematics, education will be the new work order. Previously, we looked at literacy as being able to read and write, but the next work order will be based on STEM education. Most of the jobs in the future will be based on people who are savvy and a scientifically literate populace. So what can we do on this? How to increase the basic sciences in shaping our future? We really need to understand the vertical integration of science, that the bank of knowledge we have in the basic science can be transferred from one generation to the next for transformative societies. But for that, we have to increase the basic science culture. It is equally important to increase research funding. But at UNESCO, we have promoting STEM education across the world and in all schools, in all countries. We are looking at curricular development, capacity building, advocacy, facilities, and equipment. We really must enable our children to want our science. We also have the microscience kits, robotics, and AI. And this is just to give you a, a glimpse of our programs across the world and the robotics developed by UNESCO to demystify science and science in the making. Now, I get to the next slide, wait. UNESCO was mandated in the United Nations system to produce a report which is very unusual and unique. As the world is engaged in a race against time to rethink development models by 2030, the deadline for reaching the SDGs, UNESCO produces an overview of trends in science, technology, and innovation across the world. It is the only organization to monitor these trends every five years. Last year, we produced a report, this is the UNESCO Science Report, entitled, We Are in a Race Against Time for Smarter Development. Are we using science to build the future we want? Well, this UNESCO Science Report, produced on behalf of the United Nations, identified that countries at all income levels have a dual transition towards green societies and digital societies but development priorities has also been aligned over the past five years. Science, technology, and innovation at the heart of this agenda. But we need to fast track, and that's where the challenge is for all of us. This fa flagship project, which is monitoring the science across the world, also tells us, uh, sends us a very strong message, and that is women researchers are too few and too little it's a resource we can't afford to lose. We have to mind the gender gap. The industry, the fourth industrial revolution is going to perpetuate the gender imbalance. We need more women in science, and we look forward to working with you, all member states, to increase the role of women in science, technology, and innovation. Now, UNESCO also produces a very unusual report, teaming up with engineers across the world. And this is an example of a collaboration with the World Federation of Engineering Organizations across the world. We need engineers for safe water supply, to monitor the environment, for renewable energy, for food supply. So we have to engineer the SDGs, because engineering will provide the solutions. And there are a number of recommendations in here, and we look forward to working with you on that. Now, mentioned very briefly earlier on, the role for open science. The question is no longer whether open science is happening, but rather how everyone can contribute and benefit from the technological advances. In this fragmented scientific and policy environment, we need a global understanding of open science, the meaning, and the opportunities. Because open science has really the potential and making science and quality of science, the entire process, transparent, collaborative, and inclusive. It is recognized as an accelerator for all the SDGs, 
by making it more connected to societal needs, promoting equal opportunities, it will bridge the science, technology, and innovation gaps and fulfill the human right to science. So what has UNESCO done in that regard? In this context of pressing planetary socioeconomic challenges, we need innovative solutions. We need a vibrant, basic scientific community and applied scientific research from all parts of society. And that is why science to the service of the SDGs and humanity is at the heart of UNESCO's program. And that is why UNESCO brokered over several years an agreement on a yes UNESCO recommendation on open science. This is the first international normative instrument on open science to ensure that no one is left behind. I invite you all to join the movement on open science. Now, basic science is really our greatest and collective endeavor. And this is probably an appeal to the international community who are with us here today. Science has altered our material environment, given new tools of thought and extended our mental horizon. Science generates solutions for every day of life and helps to answer the great mysteries of the universe. It gives civilization a new vitality and a new dynamism. The intense cultivation of science and its application has given us unprecedented standards of living. We all practice scientific methods in our daily lives. From the morning when we start washing our hands with soap, which contains sodium dodecal sulfate, which breaks the walls of bacterial cells. So we all start as scientists in our daily lives every morning. So what can we do? What can we do to change this momentum? How can we bring science to the, to the access of everybody? Well, what do we need for the future of science? What has the pandemic taught us? There's an importance of timely and freely accessible scientific information, the importance of scientific collaboration, sharing science, importance of science policy dialogue, and the human right to science. So basic science is indeed our greatest collective endeavor. And as we celebrate this international year for basic science, let us say that if we cannot manage science, we cannot measure it. As Nelson Mandela told us in South Africa, during the apartheid years and beyond, we need to put a face to basic science because indeed, and I will share with you our special thought of UNESCO, basic science is the beating heart of sustainable development. I thank you very much and we look forward to working with you on the numerous different initiatives across the world. Please take science home from UNESCO to your homes Put a face to science, the beating heart of sustainable development. I thank you for your attention.